Evening ladies and gents, it's Simon Brown here, uh, introducing this evening's speaker, Keith McLachlan. He's from Tebis Stockbroking, where he is a senior equity analyst, and of course he's also smallcaps.co.za. This evening we're doing pillar four of the four pillars of fundamentals, management, probably the toughest in the sense that they're hard to measure, but the most critical, because these are the folks who ultimately are running your business and need to be doing a good job of it. With that, over to Keith. Hi guys, thanks thanks for attending tonight and thanks Simon for that introduction. Um, jumping straight into it, uh, what I what I like to do, and you guys would have noticed in all the other um, uh, webinars, is like to define what you're talking about. So very simply put, what is management? Uh, it's simple. Management are the people making decisions. And this is my definition of it. You notice that's very broad. I didn't say the board, I didn't say executives, I didn't say uh, top management, senior management. It's the people making decisions. Um, now that that includes management, obviously. Um, oh, oops, sorry, that includes obviously the board. And by our board, I mean executive and non-executive. These are the sort of people when you go to your AGM, are the guys uh, addressing you. They're also often the executives, are the guys um, at the results presentations. You're talking about C CEO, COO, uh, CFO, FD. These are very big ways of, uh, of simply putting executive. The other part of the board that you perhaps don't see is the non-executive. So let's define that. Executive is very simple. Executives are employed in the day-to-day -day part of the business. Non-executives are not. And even we, we can break down the definition of non-executives even further to independent and non-independent. Independent has absolutely no interest in the business. No shareholding. They only get the director fees. And they're only there to keep uh, the executives in line and make sure good corporate governance is, is uh, observed. Non-independent, non-executives are a good example of the chairman owns half the company. Um, he's, not, he's not there for day-to-day -day management, but he actually, uh, he actually has an interest in the company. Hence, he's not, not your normal non-executive. That said... Part of management is the board. They're the top part of management, and you can split them into executive and non-executive. Um, the executives you can split further down because um, it's what they call the exco, executive committee. Now, some of the guys sitting on the exco may not actually be sitting on the board. They're still directors, but they're not representative on the board. Simple. The exco are the guys really, really responsible for the day-to-day -day operations. Um, Below the exco, you got the guys who, who by all virtue, would be on the exco except for the fact that they're not a, not directors. Now, directors actually a, a company position. Literally, you have fiduciary duty to shareholders um, if you become a director. And there's there's certain legalities you, you you have to observe and things like that. Operational management is simply an, a, a very very senior employee. So they, they don't necessarily have fiduciary duties to the shareholders, but they have their employment contracts. They're also a key key component of management, and often one, as a shareholder, you don't get to uh, interact with them, but they're there. Um, further on, now this is, where, this is why I defined management as the people making decisions, because there's other parts of management. Simply, who makes decisions? People with influence in the company. Now, Often the advisors are, are guys who have, they're not employees, they're not directors, but they have the directors, the ex-co's, they even have the senior management's ear. So the advisors, understanding who the advisors to the business are, will lend, uh, you know, will add a lot to, to your perception of the quality of management. That's what this is all about. Um, of the advisors, the obvious ones are the sponsors or the designated advisors. Now, the JSC has a rule that every listed company needs, if it's on the main board, it's called a sponsor. If it's on the Alt-X, they call it the designated advisor, a DA. It's simple. These are the guys who advise uh, uh, the companies about their listing, uh, advise them about sales announcements, advise them. You know, it even goes to the point where they advise them and they bring them acquisitions and they advise them how to structure them. You see how advisors can, can systemically change a business. Starts to become very important who the advisors are. So sponsors and designated advisors, 
There's also bankers and lawyers. These guys have great influence. Um, even external auditors. Who, who are the financial auditors signing off the financial statements? All of these are qualitative aspects of management, but it encapsulates everything in management. Um, now, I have a poker analogy. Uh, give me a bit of time to explain it. Uh, I'm not going to get into technicalities of poker. It's irrelevant. Poker is simply a game, um, and it has only three variables. It has the cards. It's the cards that you are given. It has the players. These are the participants at, at the poker table, and it has the chips. This is how you respond. Now, let me, let me extrapolate this analogy to the stock market. The stock market also only has three variables. It has the listed stocks. It's the investable options. Do you notice how that's very close to choosing what share you invest in? It's your investable options. Uh, it would, uh, it's, it's almost like the cards that you're dealt in, uh, onto the stock market. Then you get um, management and, and the other investors, the other market participants. It's simple. These are the participants. They're like the guys sitting around the poker table. Finally, you get your funds, your capital, your portfolio, your money, your savings. It's your capital base for allocation. Notice how, notice how similar this is to poker. Listed stocks are like cards. Management is like participants uh, or players. And your funds, your funds are your chips. And where you allocate them and how you use them determines things. Um, so you can choose your stocks, i.e. how to play your cards. You can choose how to allocate your funds, i.e. how to bet with your chips, but you cannot choose your management. Not unless you're a majority shareholder, it's 50% of a company plus one it gives you control, and control means you can actually choose the board. And your board chooses your management and you see it filters down. As a minority shareholder and as a retail investor, as I assume this audience is, we cannot generally choose our management. They come with the stock you pick, and hence your choice to allocate your funds is critical to who you back. Who you back is almost given to you with the company, the management. Um, hence, choose your team carefully. Now, the characteristics of quality management. It's, this is going to sound much more, uh, I'm going I'm to be very brief on this slide because it's going to sound very much like a motivational speaker. But, uh, you know, and there's tons of characteristics that are important. These, these in my mind, are some of the more important ones. And, we, and this, is, this is a uh, priority list, most important first. Capability. Would you hire them? Is management actually capable to run that company? Uh, and the question that you should be asking, that's a very bold question, put yourself Imagine you own that entire company and then ask, would you hire them? If you had the interview process, you saw all the CVs, you saw everything, um, would you actually, would you back the management team? Would you, would you hire them or would you, would you look elsewhere? That's quite a critical question and it's quite a nice, nice question to ask yourself every time you evaluate the quality of management. Then experience. Now, experience is simply a track record. Uh, what has the company done? I mean, what has management done in other companies, in other roles? Where have they come through? What is, what is, you know, what has their career path been? Um, simply put, the track record is an indication of, of, of the future. It's not always a perfect indication. It's, it's not necessarily even a forecast. But if a guy has a history of, of fraud and companies going bankrupt around him and things falling apart, you have to question, is this time going to be any different? Likewise, if, uh, on the flip side, if management has, has a history of doing really, really good deals, building companies beautifully, making them, making them strong, making them, you know, building profitability, execution of business model well, um, you know, maintaining good relations, the chances are that, uh, once again, the track record comes in their favor and they're incredibly capable. Notice our experience and capability work in sync there. Then credibility. Would you let them take your daughter out? Yeah. Now, I'm sitting in a bit of a privileged position where I have access to management. I can pick up the phone, call them, I can go and meet them, I can, you know, I can interact with them. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to look at this from a perspective of a person who perhaps doesn't have, have that ability or is sitting at home after hours after working, working a long day and just, want, just wants to look where, they, where to put their money. So these sort of questions I find quite criti critical. Now, credibility um, for, for, for fathers out there, if you would, 
look at management and you stand back. And, uh, I mean, uh, if even to the extent where you let them take your daughter out, they're definitely credible and you can trust them. Uh, likewise, if you start to think, maybe not, maybe, maybe, the, yeah. and all, all of these things pull together where it's highly unlikely that somebody with uh, lots of experience and capability that you trust wouldn't be credible. And likewise, somebody with lots of experience and capability um, wouldn't have credibility. So these things work together, but these questions are good to ask. Um, next one is words and reality. This is maybe a bit of a vague point, but it, 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 it's really, does management say one thing and do another? You know, there, there's companies out there that state their strategy as, for example, um, you know, we are, we are diversifying into emerging markets, and then you look at the next couple of acquisitions they do, and they start doing acquisitions in the U.S. and the Europe and uh, Britain, and, and you say, whoa, 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 whoa. What you just told me and what you're doing are two different things. This adds directly back to credibility, um, because if, if you're communicating something, but you're doing the other, sometimes, well, actually always, actions speak louder than words in the stock market. Uh, unfortunately, words often come before actions, and that's what prospects and management communication and strategy is. But um, keep, a, keep a close tab. Management says something. Do they actually do it? Um, and then, of course, you have to bear in mind overall good corporate governance. Uh, have a look at the board. Are there enough non-executives to keep the executives in line? You know, are, are, is, is, uh, do they have a separate audit committee? Do they have a separate re a remuneration committee? Do they have all the nice tick boxes that, uh, that creates checks and balances to ensure that your interests as a shareholder are looked after? These are the characteristics that, um, that determine the quality of management on a very basic level. Now, these sort of things are simple to say as analysts. I can go out, I can spend all the time, I can meet management, I can, I can even, you know, to the extent where I can phone up auditors and meet auditors. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as, as a retail investor, I mean, you've come home from your long, long day's work. You don't have the time to do this, and you maybe also don't have the privilege that I do to do it. So I, I'll try to put together a list of sources, um, ways and means that you can actually not, not, as well, perhaps, as, as, as somebody who has the privilege to do it, but you can actually still achieve this. And it's, it's food for thought, these, these slides. So the sources to judge, the obvious ones are uh, AGMs, which are annual, annual general meetings. Uh, companies have to hold them once a year for their shareholders. Then when there's results, companies do results presentations, and then there's other meetings, special meetings, investor days, things like that. Once again, uh, working a busy job, you may not be, have time to, um, to go to these things. If you do, or it happens to be near you, or you happen to have a day off or an afternoon or something, I strongly encourage you to go to them. In reality, you probably won't be able to go to a lot of them. So what's next best? Next best is have a look at SENS announcements, results and annual reports. Companies legally have to put these out. And sometimes it's in the best interest to put them out with the market communication, um, investor relations, and all of that. Sales announcements, have a read through them. You know, do you get the feeling that management is, because management writes these. Yes, there's all, you know, there, there's, there's, there's various uh, protocols they have to go through in various channels, but in essence, management is the guy, management's the team that signs off each sales announcement, or changes the words, or deletes a phrase, or adds a phrase, Simply read through the sense announcements. Do you get a feeling that management's talking in circles? Do you get a management a feeling that management's being ambiguous? Are, are they you know, what you're critically looking for? Is you're looking for uh, once again, you're looking for capability. Do they know what they're doing? Experience? Can they can they can they can they show? You know, does does it back up that they've done this before and they know what they're doing? Credibility? Um, are are they saying things? that they're not going to do, because that works right into words and reality, then overall, do you get a good feeling from the sense announcements that they're actually, that it's coming together, that the business plan is getting executed properly. Results, results are your classic sense announcements, but they often, they include the performance of the company. So it goes hand in hand with sense announcements, have a read of the results, uh, you know, are they giving enough disclosure, are you comfortable with it? And then the annual report, is, 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 um, must be released once a year by a listed company, 
and it always, always includes a lot more detail than just the sentence announcements and results. We'll have, you know, there's the directors. Normally, a typical one, there'll be a CEO letter, there'll be a uh, FD letter, perhaps even the chairman address to the shareholders. They perhaps even go a bit into their industry, a bit into their business model, a bit into the different segments. Have a, yeah, I'm assuming that most people on this webinar have, uh, have a couple of shares. That means that you at least have uh, you know, a couple annual reports sent to your house. Pick them up. Have a read through. The yeah, annual report is, is, is a company representing itself. Does it do it well? That's always a question to ask. And do you have enough comfort that they've, they've addressed all the risk points, they've pointed out how they're addressing them, and that they're, they're executing the business model correctly? Um, next stop is, is actually an obvious one, but surprisingly most people don't think about it, the company's website. Um, they will have an investor section. Don't just look at that. That's, that's aimed at investor relations. It's very important. It will include sense announcements, results, annual reports, often uh, analyst presentations, any presentations or uh, news they put out there. That's nice. Have a good read through that. But have a look at the other parts. Um, have a look at operations. Have a, this is where you can find who the senior management is. You can even break down to the different subsidiaries. Go have a look at the subsidiaries' websites. Have a good, good read through. Have a good feel for, for the company out of the website. And, I mean, the, the strongest, uh, a, a while back, a, a good couple of years ago, there was an IT company out there on the JSE whose website was offline. That just speaks miles about everything. If you can't find anything on the website, well, yeah, there's plenty of shares out there. Then, he has another obvious one. Once you've got the management, you know, you can start to figure who the key people are in the company. You, you, you want to know a little more about them. Uh, I, can, I can promise you that uh, the company's website, the annual reports, and all, the, all the, uh, the content generated by the company won't include all the bad stuff about the management. So Google management. You know, follow the interesting articles. Read what, uh, read what journalists are writing. Read the back issues. Go back a couple of years and read what the guy was doing then. You know, even, even to the extent if he's got a personal website or he's, he's involved in other businesses, have a look at those. Have a, have a look at his LinkedIn profile. Have a look, I mean, the, the, these sort of things. Google management. You never know what you'll find. And sometimes it's either a huge red flag or you know you're onto something good. Then uh, TV interviews, have a look on YouTube. A lot of TV interviews, CNBC, Summit, the guys actually put the interviews up on YouTube. Um, so go to YouTube, Google them there, or YouTube them there, maybe I should phrase it that way. Uh, this is all just simply getting a qualitative feel for management because it all comes down to a, a, a qualitative, you know, a subjective judgment. I'm, I'm going to phrase that again, subjective judgment. There's no way you can objectively judge the quality of management. You can only subjectively judge them. So don't feel that just because he's a CEO, he's got to be good at what he does. Um, you're the shareholder. This is your call. Back your team. And then finally, read analyst research. Talk to analysts. Guys like me, we, we have, we're in a privileged position where we have access to management. And often we have pretty strongly formulated opinions about a management that sometimes doesn't come out in research. That's why you can talk to analysts. You know, um, all, these, all these are basic sources to judge management that except for the AGMs and presentations and things you might not be able to attend, you can find all of them with an internet connection from home. Finally, well, not, not finally, but uh, without, we've got to touch on incentives. When you're talking about management, it's, it's, it's simple. Management is not there for free. They're there to make money, just like you as a shareholder are, are putting your money into the company. And often, uh, you know, good financial theory, now theory in reality can differ, but good financial theory means that you want to incentivize management to perform, hence the shareholders get the benefit of performance. But you've got to have incentives in place to align management with shareholders. So the interests are the same. Um, so, you know, don't, don't feel bad if you happen to go to an AGM, you happen to go to a presentation, ask management, how do you get your bonuses paid? Um, Go have, a, go have a look at their annual reports. Sometimes they, on, uh, unfortunately not as often as they should, but sometimes they, they actually uh, disclose these things. Management incentives are. You know, if the company's profit halved and their CEO is still getting a, a massive bonus, questions have to be asked. So, but 
you get different types of incentives. Now, management bonuses are the obvious ones. It's simple. It's a big cash bonus once they've achieved certain objectives. It all depends on who, when, and why. Who is simple. Who's getting the bonus? When is, uh, what is the timing? Um, you know, is the bonus paid over 10 years, one year, now? Is it, uh, is it, is it paid in these sort of details? Uh, and then most, probably the most important question is why? And that is often the target. Um, and why can lead to a two-edged blade. Now, incentives are all great in theory. Um, but it can be a two, two-edged blade. It can actually like hurt shareholders. Let me give you an example. If management bonus is to grow the EBITDA line by 10%, grow revenue by 10% and grow the EBITDA line by 10%. It's actually simple to do that while, while destroying profits. Because first of all, sales doesn't necessarily generate profits. So management can pump sales through the system, drop prices, everything, all in sales incentives to get huge volumes through it. Um, and then they've got their sales target. They can tick that box. Now EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, and depreciate, depreciation and amortization. Now the critical part in this is uh, interest, depreciation, and amortization. So these are all real costs that really exist that are actually below this profit item. So what management can do to, to pump sales and to pump EBITDA lines, they can, they can turn all their variable costs into fixed assets, depreciate them, buy huge businesses that add to sales, um, and then they have to amortize maybe the goodwill and the intangibles got on there. All of the, you notice how they've just boosted sales they boosted the EBITDA line, but when you have a lot of fixed costs, it often turns into depreciation. And that actually, that, that, can, that means that uh, all their sales are up 10%, EBITDA is up, depreciation, amortization, and interest, because they could also gear the business heavily to do this, hence incurring heavy interest costs. All of those could be up 30, 40, 50, 100, you know, in, in, infinite percent. Hence, the, the actual net profit line could be down. So management incentives are two-edged, Ask them, understand them, then you understand management, how they will operate and how they will approach the business, and you can start to judge that risk in there. Next one is share incentive schemes. Uh, share incentives. Now, the theory here is that management becomes a part owner in, uh, in the business, hence they start to worry about every aspect of the business, perfectly aligning them with um, the shareholders. Yes, largely arguable generally a good theory, but there can be ways that this can backfire because it's simple. Um, you issue equity to management, it is a long-term cost. Um, and the cost of dilution of issuing shares lasts forever. Um, so sometimes it's actually better just to pay the guy a cash bonus because that's once off. You pay him the equivalent cash bonus in shares, you're actually paying him this year and every year thereafter the same amount. That's, that's actually pretty pretty high cost to have. But th there are aspects to uh, get around this, and it's what they call longer-term lock-in periods. The longer the management share and schemes lock-in period, the better. And this is going to get technical, so I'll, I'll keep it sort of uh, uh, broad over you and uh, over top, uh, superficial, but, but simply being management has certain points where they can buy the, the shares and certain points when they can sell them. You want to push out the points when they can sell them for as long as possible. And, and preferably, you can award them the shares, but you don't necessarily want them to earn them, uh, i.e. to pay for them and to get the shares, or sometimes they're issued for free. But you know how you, how you want to stretch all of that out. Hence, the cost of dilution is going to be here forever. Um, and the management, once they've got the shares, could just dump them in the market and leave tomorrow. But the longer you lock them in, that they can't just do that, the longer that the, that incentive is effective. So share incentive schemes are good, but easy to abuse. Um, so read the fine print carefully. Now, the, another incentive. Now, I've included this in incentives because, well, I mean, I, I'm a small cap analyst. And, and in reality, in the small cap part of the market, often shares are listed, owned, and managed 
by the guys who founded the company. Hence, you have, you have, a, you have a situation where the founding shareholder um, is the majority shareholder. Your share incentives, they are really effective, ineffective because he's already sort of owns, say, half of the company. Um, so it's good because, once again, he's looking off the shareholders, but it is actually also subtly bad because it could lead to a situation where you have an overly dominant central figure. If, if, if one guy owns over half of the company, 50% plus one share, remember, he can, he can dictate who the directors are. Hence, he can dominate that board because if he doesn't like a guy's opinion, he can fire him and hire anybody else. Hence, no one's actually going to argue with him. And hence, corporate governance falls apart. There's, there, it's very hard to control, um, to, uh, to, to keep uh, the checks and balances in place when actually your job's online for that. And uh, every human, when it comes down to it, you know, on a very basic level, they are looking after themselves. So, then, so your approach as a shareholder is you want a strong founding shareholder. It's good. But you don't necessarily want a dominant strong founding shareholder who's going to run the, uh, who's going to run the company to his benefit and not actually necessarily yours. So once again, I'm include this under incentives. It's not necessarily incentive, but it is a two-edged blade, good and bad. Judge it in the qualitative aspects, case by case basis. Valuing people. Now, this is exactly what all our teachers tell us not to do. Uh, we, we we aren't judging people. This is a very subjective um, set of guidelines to subjectively value and and get 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 a handle, get a grasp on whether you you can back this team or not. Um, so. After, after working through this process, looking at the corporate governance, looking at the executives, uh, looking at the board, would you hire them, wouldn't you? you, know, would, you would you would you trust your daughter to date them, or wouldn't you? Um, uh, what incentives are in place? How are they running a company? It's simple. It, it all builds down to, it all ties into the fundamentals that you're in the company. Now, we've already spoken about profitability, which is the existence, which is the meaning. It's, it's the rationale of the business. Uh, liquidity is all about cash, and solvency is is all about um, it's all about financing and managing the business uh, while not overly exposing yourself to risk. And all of these are actually decisions made by people, and that is the management. So you notice how getting a handle on management can, ties into the fundamentals of valuing the company. So how does one actually approach valuing its management? Uh, First of all, it influences the fundamentals that influence your valuation. Hence, if, if management has been, if the same management team has been in place for the last decade, their, their influence is already uh, noticeable in the numbers of that company. It, it directly influences profitability, liquidity, solvency. Uh, these guys are managing the business, um, and if they're not doing well, well, the numbers will, will reflect that. If they are doing well, the numbers will once again reflect that. So be careful of not double counting management, um, but, it's, but you have to be cognizant of that. Then, the second aspect is, I mean, maybe, maybe there's been a lot of change in the business. Maybe there's been a lot of, you know, they've bought a big business. They, they've just recently listed. They've done, well, there's been a lot of top management changes. CEO's gone and new ones in and this and that. So you don't necessarily have have uh, have a sort of a decade worth or you know two or three or uh, however much of history of management's quality coming through in numbers. So you have to start becoming extremely subjective. So in this essence, and in this case, directly influences your rating of that business. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is the price earnings. I mean the the uh, price to book model. It directly influences your discount rate. You know, if um, if management is excellent, you'll tend to rate it higher. And i.e., if if you are valuing a company uh, using a DCF or some sort of some form of uh, present uh, present value, that'll imply a lower discount rate. That's that may sound confusing. These webinars are coming where we look at actually valuing businesses. Um, so perhaps after watching those, come back to this one and have a look at this slide, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, but if management's really good, you start to give them the benefit of the doubt. Management's, management's average, you take them at face value, um, and management's terrible, you actually start to build your discounts into those models. You start to build the discounts 
uh, you, you actually want to buy it at a lower rating, or you start to, or you build a higher discount rate into into your valuation model. So, just just in summary of this, perhaps slightly uh, wishy washy slide, is that be careful of double counting. Management's already been in place. Their their quote is um, mostly reflected in the numbers. Um, profit history and the, and the historical records of the company. If there's been a, a lot of change or you're not entirely comfortable with that or, or there's been a business model change or, or this is a particularly volatile market, then you have to start to uh, quantitatively measure management and build that into your numbers. And that's what valuing people is. So the conclusion, management's effect on a company is pervasive. A business strategy, a business model, um, all of these things are great, but they're only on paper. Management are the guys in place to execute it. If they're bad, they will execute it badly. And the best, the best ship in the world with a bad management will still run the ground. Likewise, um, even if management's good, but the business model is bad, you know, the best captain in the world won't be able to sail the boat with a big hole in his hull. Um, that said, management's effect on the company is pervasive. View it in context. Uh, management is simply the single most, uh, single most important qualitative factor that influences all the quantitative factors. Um, and then think, think of, I like my knowledge with poker. I'm not going to stray too, uh, like, uh, linger too much on it, but um, view it in that, in that context. You, you know, you can't choose necessarily who, if you, if you rock up at the casino and you, you're playing like a poker tournament or something, you actually can't choose who you play against. What you can choose is how you use your cards and how you use your chips. And that's your investable universe and that's your investable funds. Um, and these questions have to be asked. In the context of this qualitative evaluation of management, if you were the sole shareholder and this was a private company, would you hire them to manage your company where you went off on a holiday for 10, 10 years? Do you believe when you came back after 10 years that company would be worth more, less or the same? I.e., would you hire management? Would you let your daughter go, uh, your daughter go out with management? This is simply a question of do you trust them? Um, and, and that goes hand in hand with good corporate governance. And these good corporate governance is a cost in the company, but it is there to protect you as a shareholder. It's, it's checks and balances to make sure that the guys do what they're meant to do and don't abuse the system. And this simply leads to, to, to your lack, average or extra confidence in the company. Management is, is a pervasive effect, but what you are doing is not valuing management, you're valuing the company. So it either adds to your valuation, detracts to it, or leaves it unchanged. Um, I.e., the qualitative, the qualitative evaluation of management leads to a quantitative uh, change in your valuation. Or no change, but it needs to be borne in mind. So guys, we want to questions. I know there was a, a um, yeah, I don't want to use the word wishy-washy again, but it's, I, I cannot emphasize how important this aspect is, but it's also a, it's, it's an aspect of company that, or business and valuations that uh, a lot of guys neglect. And in my mind, it's one of the most important. So guys, any questions out there? Thanks, Keith. Uh, it's Simon here again. Um, I think it was Warren Buffett who said he hires people, he doesn't buy companies. And to the point of, of Keith has a more privileged access to CEOs and the like he absolutely does, it doesn't stop you phoning a CEO. I, years ago, I found a CEO's uh, mobile number on their website and I called it and I had about a half hour chat with him and I decided that he was great but I decided his company wasn't. But nonetheless, it was relatively easy access. Um, some questions coming through. If you've got them, just stick them in the text box. If you've got a microphone attached, you can uh, raise your hand. We'll take it there. Uh, first question coming from Christo. He's asking, are ratings such as ROE and ROA a good way to measure management's performance when capturing when compared with similar businesses? ROE, ROA are, are critical ones. They've got to be viewed in, in context of the business model and in context of the industry because some, unfortunately, are just low. Uh, like uh, profitability industries, some are high, some are, you know, it, but that said, 
if if there's direct comparatives, and I need to I need to pretext this. I have my little disclaimer. If the companies are the business models are exactly the same. They're in exactly the same industry, and they've been operating and they have the same, you know, Then in that case, and ma management's been in place on both sides for a decent decent number of years with no major top change. I would say definitively yes. That is a quantitative way of saying you're better than you. Getting a question from Susan. If she's asking uh, a, a very direct question, um, and, and uh, uh, I imagine you might want to dodge it, you, do, you might want to give her a very, very short answer. She says, to your mind, who's the top management team on the JSC? In my mind, um, well, there's one or two CEOs I like. Out there. There's a couple of FDs, there's some operational management. What's interesting is that none of these, none of these guys are in the same company. So there's, you see, uh, I've spoken about management as it's a whole. Management isn't a whole. Labor, labor mobility is, is reality, and these guys will tend to be fragmented across the market. So you may, you may love the CEO and FD, but the chairman you're a bit suspicious of, and you're not, you're not convinced he's a strong chairman. Um, so uh, in my mind, there, there's some really good guys out there, but there's no management team that jumps out to my mind as a whole that is necessarily the best one on the market. Short, sweet, nice answer. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through. Um, nope, nothing coming in, so we're going to leave it there for this evening. My thanks, as always, to yourselves for attending. My thanks to Keith McClasley. I think management is a tricky question. It is it's esoteric. There's not a formula we can run through it, but as I said right up front, and as Keith reiterated the whole way through, um, critically important and Keith just suddenly got a thought into his head so I guys just just in conclusion well, I want to add one one final piece um, you, you know it's always first of all CEOs and FDs and guys are not there because they bad all of them are generally fairly good that said you don't put yourself in top management of a listed company um, and and not expect to be judged it's, uh, so, uh, what I'm trying to say is actually, you've actually got to get personal with this. Don't feel, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, blog about you love this guy and you hate that guy and, you know, uh, like, uh, stimulate lawsuits and uh, put yourself out there. What I'm saying is, is, is choose the guys you like and don't feel bad. Don't, don't feel that you've got to like a guy just because, you know, he's earning yeah, you know, a hundred million a year and he's a CEO of a big company. It doesn't necessarily mean he's good. It just means he's good at politics. Um, so don't feel bad to judge the guys. The top guys are not, the, you know, if you put yourself top management of, of, of a company, of public company, you, you're exposed to this judgment. So, in fact, it's expected. So as, as a shareholder out there, potential shareholder, don't feel bad at all to judge these guys. Yeah, great point. They get they get paid well for it. They're, they're, it's, it's not easy jobs in many cases, but uh, rewarding in, in many senses of it. And it is part of being a, a, a CEO of, of a listed company. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. My thanks to Keith. My thanks for all of you to attending. Uh, thanks very much. Cheers.